Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni who are making a real impact in politics, public policy, government, business, philanthropy, law, and the media. Today, I'm joined by TFAS senior scholar, Don Devine, for the first ever live recording of the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Don served as director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management during the presidency of Ronald Reagan, a role which famously earned him the title of Reagan's terrible swift sword due to his reform of the civil service and his success in accomplishing Reagan's agenda. Don has also had a distinguished career in academics, writing eight books, teaching at the University of Maryland and Bellevue University, and being known as a proponent of fusionist philosophy. Don is many things. He was a dedicated civil servant. He is a leading scholar and an expert political scientist. You'll be hearing our discussion from a recent TFAS luncheon. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I've uh, started hosting a podcast called Liberty and Leadership uh, about five months ago. And so far, I've only interviewed alums of Fund for American Studies programs. Uh, they've included uh, an editorial writer at the Wall Street Journal, uh, the uh, minority leader of the Illinois State Senate, a justice of the Arizona Supreme Court, and uh, the latest one I just recorded that'll be released in about a week is uh, an alum of ours who works for PGA Golf and the Golf Channel. So it's a variety of very interesting guests we've had on. Uh, but we thought today, uh, since we were assembling this group for the first time, and I hadn't hosted one with a non-alum that Don Devine would be the one to kick this off with. So I thought I'd ask Don some questions today and then uh, we'll have a discussion. Uh, we may run with just my short interview with Don in the podcast. We may include some of the conversation if nobody objects, uh, but I think it'll be fun and I think it'll be very informative. I so will say, by the way, the general rule is uh, this is all off the record, but uh, today, obviously, we can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don, you've had a long and distinguished career that has spanned many fields, including academia. I'm old, uh, No. <laughs> uh, well, it's included academia, service in government, involvement in many political campaigns, including on or around several presidential campaigns. While doing this, you've always kept your attention focused on ideas and on the ideas that underpin the American Constitution and individual liberty. Uh, the result has been you've written several what I think are brilliant books over the years that defend the values Here's of Western. One great one. Yeah, his, we'll get you a copy of this eventually. His latest is The Enduring Tension, Capitalism and the Moral Order, which I think we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, but these books have looked into political philosophy, and they've led Don, uh, you to have the label as the leading fusionist, uh, at least the leading one living today. Uh, and, uh, That's one you've, of the problems. <laughs> as, as you said, you've hosted for almost nine years a uh, evening dinner with uh, people who would describe themselves probably most likely as conservative or libertarian, but who understand and uh would, wouldn't be too quick to reject the label fusionism. Uh, but could you begin by just telling us precisely what is fusionism? Well, it's taken me 10 books to try to figure it out. So I can't really say uh, too much about what it is, but very simply, it's, uh, it, it, it's a synthesis derived from Western civilization uh, between freedom and tradition. I mean, that, that's the end of it. Uh, uh, not a Hegelian uh, synthesis, but an open-ended synthesis, uh, uh, Iacian synthesis rather than a Hegelian one. Does that help? help well, at all? <laughs> yeah, it does help, I think. To I know you like to call it a, a synthesis, and it's it's often mistaken as some sort of political coalition that's pulled together of uh, people with different hierarchy of values when it comes to foreign policy or religious issues or economics. So I think calling it a synthesis is somewhat helpful. 
but why don't we look at the history of the idea? Uh, when was it developed and who are the key figures who developed the idea of fusionism? Well, as I mentioned, uh, Hayek is the uh, one that started it all, in my opinion. What it is, is some uh, serious thinkers, World War II, saying, how do we get to two of these world wars to try to destroy Western civilization? Uh, it's seen all of the hyper-rationalist uh, uh, philosophies fail. Uh, Hegel himself, uh, uh, much less communism, fascism, Nazism, or welfare liberalism, uh, welfare state liberalism. Uh, um, they'd seen all this fail. Uh, they, they'd all come to various degrees of, uh, of power and none of them seemed to be working. Even the welfare state uh, in the United States uh, basically fell apart in 1938 when the Republicans uh, uh, gained uh, over 100 seats in the House and uh, uh, I forget how many in the Senate. But anyway, they became a, a live force uh, and basically blocked the welfare state uh, from 1938 to 1965, but to stay back uh, in that period, um, everybody seemed to be thinking something was wrong and this guy, Frederick Hayek, steps up and writes this book. Uh, uh, um, uh, was it The Road to Serfdom? The Road to or, Serfdom, yeah. right. And uh, he, uh, uh, he influences an incredible number of people. Uh, it's a fluke. Uh, a guy who's the head of the largest circulation magazine in America uh, reads this thing. Uh, he says, this is great. Uh, this is a, kind of an academic book, all right? And he puts it in the most broad uh, sort of reader's digest, it was called. Uh, uh, and it goes around the country and kind of everybody, you know, who read, reads it. Uh, um, and uh, especially uh, uh, in terms of, he didn't use the, the term fusion, of course, uh, uh, um, but he picks up a guy named uh, William F. Buckley who is just enamored by it. Uh, uh, Frederick, uh, I mean, Frank Meyer, Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, all of them uh, said what inspired them was Road to Serfdom, uh, to start rethinking uh, about uh, whether the welfare state uh, uh, is just a, a nicer version of some of the other things that were going along. Uh, uh, so, Hayek stands out to me among all the rest. Uh, uh, um, well, should me, I talk a little more let, about let him? Me, let me let me ask about that all because right. Hayek is uh, beloved by libertarians. He won a Nobel Prize in economics, a leading figure in the Austrian School of Economics, uh, and of course, the last chapter in another book he wrote. Uh, which was, was the one that convinced me the, co uh, the Constitution of Liberty, Constitution the Constitution of Liberty. Liberty. Uh, his last chapter, he called, he titled "Why I'm Not a Conservative." Uh, libertarians certainly love the title. Uh, and uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about that chapter? And uh, you know, yeah. Hayek, Hayek seemingly rejection of conservatism. Yeah. Well, I. I I used to always get, uh, Ed Crane was a long time leader. Of the, the, Cato, the president of Cato, the former Cato president of Cato. Cato. Yeah. Um, uh, and he named uh, his main uh, uh, meeting room uh, after Hayek. Uh, uh, I always used to kid him. And, you know, I really appreciate you uh, naming it after a fusionist. <laughs> it always used to drive him nuts. <laughs> uh, um, uh, 
he you read the chapter the chapter is remember he wrote uh, uh, his early works from england all right he's talking about english tories uh, that's what he's talking about uh, it's nothing to do with uh, 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 fusionist conservatism uh, um, uh, uh, Hayek is most important not as an economist, not as a, uh, even a, 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 a simple philosopher. He's, a, he's an epistemologist, and what he does for a long, a large, large group of people is relooks at epistemology as how uh, thinking is done. Uh, uh, as early as 1945, uh, uh, he's saying uh, he distinguishes between uh, mon monistic rationalism, uh, the principles devise, derive everything from it, uh, Hegel, Marx, the, uh, but uh, many in the middle, many uh, on the right. Uh, uh, it's a way of thinking that uh, synthesis, in the non-Hegelian sense, is a legitimate way of thinking. And that uh, principles are not fully derived from any single thing. Uh, uh, and it's this tension that I use in my art from him and from Meyer, it's this tension between uh, freedom and uh, 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 tradition, uh, the moral order of Western civilization, which he goes into. Uh, and again, all of this is spelled out, not so much in his first work, but in uh, the Constitution of Liberty, which uh, uh, is really the philosophical foundation of, of fusionism. Uh, um, uh, in constitutional liberty uh, is on page 61 and by crazy when uh, in the original edition and by crazy coincidence in the in the modern liberty fund thing it's on 120 or 121 i forget uh, he says uh, something that just dropped made me uh, uh dropped it he says uh, uh paradoxical as it may appear it is probably true he always makes a little pun there probably true that a successful free society will always in large measure be a tradition bound society uh, uh, that there's some hookup between them that's why i i can call him a a fusionist uh, though he never used the term um uh in his great uh, work, Kinds of Rationalism, uh, which I think even Cato has the wrong version of, uh, but uh, um, he makes a distinction between what he calls constructive rationalism, uh, which starts unambiguously from single monist and essences and, and deduces all conclusions from them, and a critical rationalism that employs multiple reasoning methods. Uh, I mean, in a fatal conceit in 1991, he even uh, gives uh, uh, religion a kind of backhanded uh, kind of thing. He says, uh, util rationalist utilitarianism is, is obviously insufficient. Um, but uh, but, uh, but even those not prepared to accept an anthropologist anthropological conception of a personal divinity or to admit that the premature loss of what we regard as non-factual beliefs would have deprived mankind of a powerful support in the long development of the extended order we now enjoy and that even now the loss of these beliefs whether true or false creates great difficulties he's uh, a man that sees multiple sources uh, uh, of reason, uh, and uh, I, I, it's probably not anywhere near the dominant movement today, but uh, at least to me, the more impressive thinkers uh, can get out of this box of first principle, derive everything from it, uh, which is the basis of the kind of 
all of the modern ideologies. Well, let's shift a minute to Frank Meyer's role in all this. Uh, his book, In Defense of Freedom, is in some sense, I suppose, the original source of fusionist philosophy or, or popularization of fusionism, even though I think Meyer rejected that word. It was used to disparage his ideas uh, by Brent Bozell, as I recall. Right. Uh, why did you think he rejected that word? And you know what, what? What you know? What was Frank Meyer's role in all this? Because he was a uh, Hayekian, uh, and, uh, and he's not a, a single source uh, person. And, and and of course, fusionism implies Hegelianism, really, oh, that they're idea. coming together and they stay together and emerge as uh, perfect at the end. Uh, uh, but he's looking at tradition as a, a vital source between uh, uh, tradition and freedom. Uh, he calls freedom the, uh, uh, the, the criterion principle, uh, and it should dominate decision-making. But in order to fill it out, you need to rely back on tradition too and they they why the while freedom is always the the principle the first principle it has to take into account in order to live in a complex world and, and of course hayek on complexity is just enormously important uh, uh, that you need uh, to think in this uh, tension terms uh, Actually, I would argue defensive freedom is not uh, his best piece. Uh, uh, the Liberty Fund uh, uh, compilation, uh, which I had a little to do with, but uh, I didn't make this critical decision. Uh, um, the guy who put together the, uh, in defensive freedom is called In Defensive Freedom and Other Essays. Uh, and the last essay in the book is this one on Western civilization, which is uh, really Meyer's best theoretical piece that explains it. And I think. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that Liberty Fund edition was edited by Bill Dennis. I Bill think, Dennis, Dennis. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, he. I shouldn't tell you. But, uh, he actually lists, uh, I think. 12 or 15 uh, uh, people who were important in starting this fusion is saying, I'm the only one still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's go further back uh, for a minute. And uh, it seems like there's a renewed interest today in the philosopher John Locke. Uh, people, he's been disparaged by some on the right uh you've come to his defense in some of your writing don uh but why has someone who lived uh more than 300 years ago become a contro controversial figure among conservatives today because, well it's among everybody uh i mean john locke is clearly uh, uh the source everybody goes to supporting freedom uh, to some extent or another so if you want to take a, off after freedom Locks your guy to go after. Uh, I mean, it's clear is the dominant influence in the uh, Declaration of Independence uh, uh, in writing that and uh, all the importance of freedom. Uh, um, even Leo Strauss, uh, who I wrote 45 years ago against this interpretation of Locke. Uh, and for those interested, <laughs> I mean, he he does not say he's talking about Locke. He says he's talking about Locke's partial law of nature in which he throws out his whole tradition side and only keeps the freedom side and naturally uh, calls him a uh, unitarian uh, 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 utilitarian philosopher. Uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, where was I going here? Um, oh, the reason everybody is supporting them is uh, going against them. Uh, now, 
the conservative part of this that kind of kept this uh, libertarian uh, traditionalist balance between the two uh, uh, politically through Reagan and downhill ever since, but it's kind of broken now. Um, so uh, now you're getting lock uh, going against lock for freedom from both sides of, of the equation. Uh, so to me, it's very important uh, to, to keep, uh, and as I say, I've been doing this for more than a half a century, uh, uh, that uh, he's part of the freedom equation, uh, and he also uh, accepts the importance of, of tradition and uh, and how, I mean, he wrote one book uh, uh, in defense of uh, 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 Christianity. I mean, uh, I don't know how you can think that's a total, uh, uh, but anyway, go ahead. Well, uh, let me ask you. I hate well, up all you, this no, well, let's, with everybody here. Let me but, uh, ask a few more questions and then we'll see if others have questions <laughs> to ask you. Uh, the word religion has been mentioned once or twice uh, when uh, you say there's this tension, fusionism, fusionists believe in this tension or synthesis of freedom and tradition. By tradition, it, do, can you easily substitute the word religion? Uh, Hayek you know, tradition certainly wasn't much religious. More. It's, but, it, it's yeah. much more than the, or re religion, but religion's part of it. Uh, I mean, it, it's the history, the mores, uh, that have been developed over a long uh, uh, period of time. Uh, I mean, it was terribly against tradition in 1960 when the, when Hayek uh, and constitutional liberty starts the uh, uh, liberty with uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, Magna Carta, I mean, that, that wasn't allowed for at least 50 years. Uh, uh, um, uh, that answer, uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, what role do you think fusionism can play today? Can it, I mean, I, I think people who call themselves, say, small L libertarians, people call themselves conservative in the broad sense of that word. Of course, there there's the uh, establishment conservatives, I guess, traditional conservatives, new right conservatives, uh, MAGA Republicans, etc. But can confusionism somehow play a role in bringing together uh, these very uh, divided groups today and, and, mm -hmm. and, and lead to a uh, movement, a freedom, pro-freedom, I guess, and pro-tradition movement that can do something to fight back against progressive takeover of government? Well, uh, in 1960, uh, when all this started uh, getting organized, the first conservative and the first libertarian really uh, uh, institutions uh, uh, are boiling up. I mean, any thought that uh, this idea could go anywhere was, I mean, just ridiculous. <laughs> um, I mean, we weren't even covered in the, uh, the newspapers. Uh, we didn't exist. Uh, 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 um, in fact, it was a, that was a great thing. We were able to do incredible things, get away with murder, uh, really. Uh, uh, nobody was writing about it. Uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, remember what happened in 1964? We put up one of these candidates, right? right? Uh, he got, got wiped out. He, he got, not only got wiped I mean, he revived welfare statism. Uh, right? Uh, the Democrats picked up two thirds in both houses of Congress, all right? And that's got them back on board to the great society. Uh, uh, I mean, how could that idea have a possible chance anywhere? And all of a sudden, you have 1976, a guy's running like this, all right? Straight out. <laughs> all right? Uh, Ronald Reagan kind of took some of the edges off, but uh, um, he, he, he's running. Uh, we had nobody. I, I was one of his uh, leading political people. We would go out to try to have an event in a place. We could not get one elected Republican to come out. Remember, we're running against an incumbent Republican president. We couldn't get one political official to come out. We had to take... Uh, 
retired people or somebody. I mean, nobody would stick up for him. Uh, and yet it came this close to beating him, and of course. In and, 60, and that was in 1976 when 76. Ronald Reagan was former governor challenging President Gerald Ford. Right. And then four years later. Four years was, later, he's elected and uh, don't do everything, but we get a lot done uh, uh, in, the, in, in the tradition. And that's the way I view it again. I've seen it go all the way down, all the way back. Uh, and uh, um, the importance of fusionism, and it, it doesn't take everybody uh, to do this. Uh, uh, if there are a few people that can take into account kind of what I consider both sides, but it, it includes all sides as far as I'm concerned. I, there's very few things that have no truth to them, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, if you have fusionists who are listening to both sides, who, who the way we define it as libertarians and traditionalists, uh, 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 um, Lord Acton uh, said, you know, the true friends of freedom are very few. Uh, when you look at the history of the world. And what we need is believers in freedom that can reach out to the, everybody else. I mean, uh, so that's what makes it uh, important to me and, and, and gives it so hope. Uh, uh, and I agree, it looks pretty hopeless. Uh, uh, and maybe I'm lucky to get out uh, uh, when I am, but. Uh, uh, it, but again, you know, it looked hopeless in 1944 with this uh, professor in England uh, out of his own country uh, writing a book in a language that's not his. Uh, and it looked the same way in 1964 when uh, Goldwater got slaughtered. Uh, um, yeah, I, I remember sometime in the, I think I was in college at the time, but Emmett, Ter Terrell, founder of the American Spectator, I think put together a book that he edited before Thatcher, and it was called Will There Always Be in England? Because <laughs> England was in such, it was going downhill so fast mm -hmm. with strikes mm -hmm. and unemployment and inflation and all the things we were experiencing to a lesser extent in the U.S. And it was, you could actually ask that question, is England going to survive? And then it all got turned around by Lady Thatcher or, or much of the way around. Well, you wrote a book before your your uh, uh, the enduring tension called "The Way Back." Uh, is there a way back? Since you've just touched on this, or is our country too far down, and not just to the path of socialism, but toward kind of financial bankruptcy and unfunded liabilities that could easily drown our financial system? Or uh, can we return to being kind of a bastion of freedom in the world? Well, I kind of answered it before. I've seen yeah. it all up and down, but uh, uh, but you, how far we've come. I, I, lately, I've been getting on the Federal Reserve System. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, if you can't reform the Federal Reserve, and, and we got everything else done that we would like, uh, it wouldn't make any difference, especially on the economic side. Uh, um, uh, I just read a good book, which I can't even think of the guy's name right now. But uh, um, but the, my point is, to change things, we got to do the fundamentals. We can't fool around with the little stuff. Uh, I don't mean that you don't have to write whatever you have to write to survive, uh, as I do, as anyone does. Uh, uh, but to recognize that the fundamentals are wrong. We've been off term for a hundred. Woodrow Wilson is the problem, uh, uh, and we need to uh, uh, face directly uh, uh, this philosophy that's been running the country for the last hundred years under his uh, inspiration, turned the whole country around. Uh, he went to 
uh, Europe and he found out that big government works, come back, write, writes a book I had to read in college uh, uh, about uh, what's wrong with separation of powers, which to me is the essential element of freedom. Uh, uh, um, uh, what, why do you say it, separation of powers is the most essential element of freedom? Because everything else has to be done by somebody, and you can't trust anybody to do it. Uh, um, uh, you need power to balance power. Uh, uh, purely rationalist division, uh, 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 definitions of freedom just don't work. Uh, they're just what I want to do, all right? Uh, uh, what separation of powers does, and, and why Magna Carta is so important to, to me, and the Hayek, constitutional liberty, I mean, uh, it's when you separate these people from each other that freedom has a chance. Uh, uh, so at one of our meeting night meetings, I, I, we were defending freedom kind of early on. I said, freedom is, is separation of powers. Everybody laughed. Uh, I think they have changed. So some of them anyway have changed. But um, uh, that's what we need and we don't have. Uh, uh, um, and institutions like the Federal Reserve are running off in insane places. Uh, as much as nobody will say, we need gold. Even people who believe in gold don't believe in it. <laughs> uh, um, we need something to restrict that thing because you can't fix anything else if the, the Fed can just print money forever. Uh, my opinion, we're still in the 2008 uh, re Great Recession, uh, as I said in the book you just mentioned. Uh, uh, way back in 13, uh, that it was still going on. Uh, and we're going to face, I think we're going to get hit real hard, but I think I always see both sides. Uh, I think it, it could be so bad that in 2024, we could actually fix the Federal Reserve. Uh, if things are bad enough, uh, things that we didn't think possible could be possible. Uh, They've got the whole, their whole system starting again in 1965 when they got, uh, uh, they got two thirds in both houses of Congress. That might be possible if it gets bad enough by uh, 2024 uh, uh, and a Republican president, who knows what would be possible. Uh, so that's well, kind of optimistic. Well, <laughs> I, I was at, at the dinner where you emphasize the importance of the separation of powers. I don't think I laughed at you, but <laughs> I did push back because I'm not sure I understood exactly what you were saying, but I came around to understand that, uh, it was, it was, it was, ac it was correct. Uh, the key being the separation of powers and not just in the sense of how our constitution does it, but the concept more generally is, is well, let, let me shift in, uh, slightly and ask one more question. And that is, you know, you were, director of the Office of Personnel Management in President Reagan's first term. That means you had oversight over the civil service and the federal bureaucracy. Uh, I know you value very highly Mises, Ludwig von Mises' book, Bureaucracy, and you wrote your own book, a very important book on the subject of bureaucracy that was only reprinted a few years ago. Uh, because it was so valuable that even it had gone out of print and, and someone saw fit to uh, put it back into print. Talk just a little about that experience. Uh, it obviously gives lie to the progressive argument, the Woodrow Wilson argument that you can have rule by experts because uh, ultimately bureaucracy just doesn't function. Could, could you talk about that? Because I've learned a lot from you on that subject. Well, I mean, I stole it all from von Mises, all right? A little book called Bureaucracy, published, believe it or not, by Yale University Press, all right? Anybody can read it in a couple of hours, all right? Uh, but nobody has. Uh, uh, so I read it. Uh, um, uh, 
uh, and it, it's so simple. Big bureaucracies need ways to communicate from the top to the bottom, right? That's the premise. Private sector has this wonderful thing. You can have a hundred, although the private sector seem, tends to have less division. You can have a uh, hundred levels of it in theory. Uh, and at each level, you can go down and ask them one question and you can find out what's going on in the biggest bureaucracy. What is it? Is it making a profit or not? Right? And if it is, you do more of it. And if it isn't, you do less of it or get rid of it or whatever. What's the alternative in the government? It doesn't have that little mechanism to find out what's going down below. In fact, if you did get down there and find out if it was making a profit or a loss, if it's losing, you increase what you spend on it. All right? And, uh, 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 if it's uh, working, you'll probably change it anyway. All right? You don't know what it is. Uh, uh, I, I use the rock of Gibraltar as a uh, thing in the, when I do a, a lecture on this. Uh, uh, and the president is sitting up at the top of the rock of Gibraltar. And the, every level, every couple of feet uh, uh, going down there, there's a different level until you get to the bottom uh, of the water right at the Mediterranean. Uh, those are, this is at the head of the Mediterranean, big rock. Uh, 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 that's where the people are, all right? And the president has no idea up there what's going on down there or, or very little. And everything he reads is, is biased in some degree anyway, uh, all right? He doesn't know how to, and, and in fact, he can't even really order the second level people, the, the ones who have, even as dumb as Congress has, they still have all the power in the hands of the cabinet officers, not the president. Of course, all you people who are sophisticated, you know, an executive order is not a law, is not anything. It says, please, Mr. Secretary, will you do this? Uh, um, that's what it is. There's no legal thing beyond that. Now, occasionally a court will reach it. They have nothing else to make up the laws. They'll They'll pretend it's uh, the law, but uh, the legal fact is that they have it. Uh, the president is asking you to do it. But even he, and of course the secretaries have no more idea what going down three levels below them, uh, much less 20. Uh, uh, um, the guy at uh, Brookings Institution says there is, 70 different levels uh, that you have to go down to see what's going on before you hit real people. I think that's exaggerated in my experience, but let's say it's 50, all right? Uh, and at each level, they can do anything they want. And in fact, what can they do to uh, a, a, a political appointee who actually wants to do something? You go to the Washington Post, all right, then you turn them in, all right? And if you're lucky, you won't go to jail. Uh, um, uh, uh, this is a system that can't work intellectually, uh, uh, as Mises proved, and my experience for uh, eight years, it, it doesn't work. And I went back in for six months just recently, uh, the, the final people who finally understood what uh, personnel was about got in the Trump administration about six months ago and somebody gave them that book. Uh, uh, so they had me go in the government. It's so much worse now than it was then. It's unbelievably worse because, you know, Jimmy Carter, Democrat, he saved the, the, the system. Uh, he, he hired my professor, big liberal Democrat, uh, uh, to be the head of the first, the head of OPM to, 
the, and what OPM is, is to give the executive branch some control over what's going on in the agencies. Uh, um, and he was a genius. He taught me, uh, uh, I don't think he referred me to Mises' book, but uh, his thinking got me to go there. Uh, um, uh, and he had some kind of a re reform of the civil service? Yeah, he passed the right. Civil Service Reform Act in 1978. Uh, if anybody's around, just repass his, all right? It's not great, but it's much, much better. And, and while well, I was in the last six months looking at the, this again, the, uh, the bureaucracy has overturned almost everything in that law. It's still the law, but they found different ways to do this. You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, uh, if it, it, it was really impossible to run the civil service when I was there, although I had them frightened enough for four years that uh, uh, kept threatening the retirement system. That's the best uh, way to get them to listen to you, at least. Uh, um, uh, and, it, and that's what led to the, the Washington Post giving you the moniker as Reagan's terrible swift sword, right, Don? That's, right. that's what they call me. <laughs> okay. and, and in their, their international edition, uh, they had on the front page a drawing of Che Guevara, uh, like Che Guevara and his hat, but my face on it. <laughs> well, and you actually did <coughs> reduce the size. Yeah, we, we got, <coughs> we're the only employment. ones that have done it in modern times. We got 100,000 non-defense employees, period. We reduced the pension benefits as rich as it still is now. It's much uh, uh, less... Uh, than it was, we changed that too. Uh, we did all kinds, we put in the performance appraisal system that actually tried, performance appraisal, by the way, I would meant to say, is the only mechanism a, a government bureaucracy has. But what does a, a performance appraisal system do? It asks the ones who are creating the problem how they're doing, <laughs> you know? Uh, it doesn't quite work, but, uh, my predecessor did give us some tools to make it work. Again, most of them are, are gone, but uh, 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 at least uh, uh, you could try to do that if you get in. Well, thank you very much, Don. I think it's time to open this up to discussion. So <laughs> it is, I will. I hate uh, talking all this time. No, uh, I, I, I think uh, it'd be great to have a conversation about fusionism. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll bring the podcast to an end. Thank you, Don, very much. Thank you for uh, being very attentive and uh, we'll cut the mics and we can let loose. All right. I <laughs> like you. that much better. Uh. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfast.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Reed. And until next time, show courage in things large and small. <laughs>